ain't gonna let radiation turn me around. Oh, turn me around. Oh, turn me around. Ain't gonna let radiation turn me around. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom. My name is Whale Sucks, Kathy Samson Cruzy. I'm a member of the Walla Walla. Cayuse and Umatilla tribes. 25 years ago we were here. 25 years from now we're going to be here again. 25 years further we're going to be here. My father is Chief Mielk's head man of our tribe and he'd like to open with a prayer and also some words of wisdom about why we came today. In our language, good afternoon. I'm glad to see you all gathered here today. This is the homeland of my people, of the Walla Wallas. Goes clear up through the Hanford Reach, throw to the Blue Mountains, clear south along the Columbia River to Willow Creek. This is where my people lived and died. My leader, Pia Pia Mox Mox, whom I'm named after, my great great grandfather gave up his life just a few miles from here on this side of Walla Walla. They murdered him. They took his life. When they did this, they totally dismembered my chief. They cut off his ears, cut off his hands, cut off his feet. They cut strips, cut strips like this off his back. And they once they scalped his head, they made buttons on, on, for souvenirs for those volunteer soldiers. That's all they were, volunteers, not real soldiers. But this, the price we talk about, we've paid those prices already. Years ago, this land was holy to my people. Clear up and down the Columbia River, now look at it. We can't even eat the salmon that swims in that river because they're so contaminated. And DOE said years ago, I was chairman of the Nuclear Waste Commission at that time. They kept telling us it, it won't hurt your people, it won't hurt those fish, it won't hurt the water. But look what it's done 25 years ago. Today, we pray for our elders that have gone on. We pray every day for our youth, for our young ones that are coming up. Those leaders years ago, all the ones that signed the treaty, prayed seven generations ahead. And this is what they did. They gave our leaders a medal like this, called a peace treaty medal. This is a Jefferson Medal that was given to me. But I wonder whether it's worth it for what the price we had to give. We gave up 6.5 million acres that our people never owned. We said we'd be here to take care of it and protect it. But this happened, hasn't happened that way. So today, Creator, we ask you to look into each one of your hearts, and your mind, your bodies, that you'll be safe from such harm that has happened to all of our people across this country. Katsiaio, I thank you. Hi. My father's, my mother over here, our lifeblood, our elders, they're not going to be with us too much longer. They used to tell us, take care of yourself, take care of your children. We ask that you think of that every day. Be blessed every morning when that sun rises. Put your hands out and hug that sun and be blessed and be mindful that it's going to rise one more time and we'll walk among this earth again. Be mindful that one day when we leave this earth, we'll have done good. And that's the most that we can say. Just in closing, I want to welcome you to the beautiful Walla Walla Valley. 
We don't know how many of our ancestors are buried here. We don't know how many have been dug up and taken over across the oceans, put in some type of mausoleum or sold off. But be mindful of this place. When I was arrested down at Jameson Park in Occupy, it was really hard. And for those people that stood with us and those people who continue to stand with us across the world, I applaud you. I give you everything in my heart and soul to be strong. So in closing, we just really want to be thankful today. We always want to be mindful and know that these children climbing in these trees, they're going to be back here. They're just mischief little ones right now, wondering where they're going with Ola, their grandma. They're Katza, they're Pusha, but they're on this traveling trail. Hi, Katsiaya. Raise your hand like this, don't clap, raise your hand. When you raise your hand like this, you're praying, you're having the Creator hear those words and they're taking them to that world. Hi, Katsiaya. Many people have asked me why Occupy Portland chose to come to Richland, Washington. It's very simple. We want to talk about the problems surrounding the Hanford site, which have been long suppressed. We are here because Hanford is here. The problems plaguing the Hanford cleanup are significant. We believe that not enough attention or information regarding the environmental hazards and the immense difficulties with the cleanup have been discussed and brought to your attention. We are here because living in Portland is living on the Columbia River. A disaster here impacts all of us. We are here because we care. Occupy Portland decided to create A15, a day of awareness and education to bring speakers in, to hold a conversation about everything that is going on at Hanford. This is the Sunday before Earth Day. We thought it would be appropriate. Hanford is an environmental tragedy waiting to happen. There are 177 waste tanks holding 56 million gallons of highly hazardous radioactive waste. One third of these tanks have leaked. This legacy of waste results from, the world, from World War II and the Cold War programs to build nuclear bombs. And radioactive nuclear waste lasts for thousands of years. Bechtel estimates that nuclear waste, putting this into a stable waste form, has grown from $4.6 billion to unofficial estimates today that costs will exceed $20 billion. That's $20 billion. The schedule to finish it has grown from seven years to over 20 years, and many technical issues still exist and continue to surface. After a decade of effort to attempt to stabilize this waste, no one from DOE Bechtel or URS can take this microphone today and assure us that the vitrification plant will operate safely. <laughs> Trapped gas and hydrogen explosions like we saw at Fukushima and potential nuclear criticalities threaten the operation of the waste treatment plant. We in Occupy Portland want the proper attention devoted to this project. We want it done right. We do not want the Columbia River to be contaminated. We care. Woo! Nuclear power faces a similar problem. You cannot harness nuclear power without creating nuclear waste. With the help from our environmental leaders, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Occupy Portland, we will pursue a major effort to shut down the Columbia Generating Station at Hanford. Yeah! We don't need another legacy of waste for future generations to struggle with. A lot of you have asked what Occupy Portland demands, and we do have demands. Occupy Portland demands new, independent, external oversight for the successful completion of the cleanup at the Hanford site. Occupy Portland demands that all issues, the true cost and real schedule, be published. Yeah. 
We demand that independent oversight is the only way to get this and the cleanup back on track. External oversight will see that the working conditions at Hanford are safer for the workers and in turn the community at large. Independent oversight will support employees bringing up issues. Without external oversight, the state of the cleanup will continue as it does today. Right now, the beneficiaries from the cleanup are the contractors. Meanwhile, our tax dollars are thrown into the pit and the environment remains threatened while they make their profits. Today we will hear from many speakers who have spent a majority of their lives educating people to the realities of nuclear weapons and nuclear waste. We will also hear about the environmental impacts of nuclear power on the ecosystem and why a world with nuclear power is not viable, especially when we have alternative energies available to us which do far less harm to the planet. We will hear from peace workers and from doctors and from people in the Tri-Cities community. Unfortunately, we will not be hearing from the organization in charge of the cleanup. We invited the DOE to come speak about parts of the cleanup that have been successful and to share with us the issues that need our attention so that we can bring the cleanup to completion. Yeah. The DOE refused our offer. Yes, they did. We tried many times to bring them here to the stage. The lack of communication with the public is part of the problem with the cleanup. We need open communication and transparency so that we can move forward together for a cleaner world for at least the next seven generations. 70% of the planet is water. 70% of our bodies is water. Same salinization in the amniotic fluid in the teardrops in the water in the ocean. Therefore, why am I buying energy when everything I need is right here? If the sun shines all goddamn day, why do I even have to go to the grocery store? You feel me? And that's what's cracking. I know it sounds simplistic. They want to make it seem really complex. Like, like sister said that was up here. They took the poison fire so they could boil water. Well, look, dog, you didn't even need to do all that. You feel me? Yeah. So why do you want to split and divide everything like subatomic particles when your body is already intact? When you already got everything you need living and breathing right in front of you, only thing this promise is death. So why motherfuckers trying to race to the bottom, right? Real talk. Hey, it's good to see the kids rolling down a hill. I remember I used to love that. People don't do that no more. They sit in front of the, the buttons and whatnot. I used to think that an awesome way to get in shape would be to try to roll up a hill. <laughs> I haven't mastered that yet. Real talk, say. I let the music raise buzz for community singers. Start a high school that is soon to be finished. I'm thinking about starting a community guard. Trillions on the wall, why the poor people are starving? Music is a tool in the hands of the artists. Do the right thing and it makes you a target. When the pigs murder the innocent and walk scot free, we gotta occupy the property and block the streets. I'm man in the section between love and liberation and doctrination and occupation. I demand a response to this emergency so the government is conscious of insurgency so much work to do so few jobs to find financial sector loots and robs your blind politicians are puppets and the pope protects predators the paper's propaganda projected by the editors Shoot. somebody help me uh, this is not helping oh, man. i am not wealthy but i do have the power to break the chains doing what's right you might you might lose your life true they want you to think it's suicide, y'all. We don't change the way. I'm going in. Like a shank to the pancreas, I believe in the government with the faith of an atheist. Rebellious, like Chavez of Venezuela, man, my focus goes far beyond genitalia. Surgical, I go past cervical thresholds from beneath the earth's surface, surpass UFOs. Thrust to the facade, sequestering God. Plumb to the depths, that's my quest to my job. Hit the uproot the implants, it's metal to kickstand. I'm a corrupted, a busted, illegitimate system. If you believe in revolution, you threaten with prison. Liberty or death, man, what's the decision? No moral end. Ambiguity, all the ingenuity is thoroughly directed at war with the community. No matter what they do to me, won't change the fact. Freedom's a human right, it's time to take it back. Somebody help me. That's work. This is not no. I am not well feet, but I do have the power to break the chain. Doing what's right, you might. You might lose your life, you might get you.
They want you to think of suicide, dog. We gon' change the game. Keep the characteristics of an American misfit in a materialistic authoritarian system. As far as human relations, we know the master plan includes self-determination for all Africans. Coming from a deficit on the edge of a precipice, exploited by greed and racial prejudice. Our President Obama, Iraq to Pakistan. I'm marching in Richland to take back the land. Submerged up in coil and purges oil. The dispersers from the poison the oceans and soil. The merchants are deaf, are certainly loyal. To murder for profit, the whole earth is a royal. So how do we stop this obnoxious nonsense? A meeting, a form, a constant accomplice? I understand the need to talk and process, but we need action, not just thoughts and concepts. Somebody help me. That's the word. This is not healthy. Get oh, it. I am not wealthy, but I, I do have the power to break the chains. For what's right, you might. You might lose your life, too. They want you to think it's suicide, y'all, but we gon' change the game. You understand what I'm saying? You know, this artistic thing is a tool. Let's use it. We gon' echo the truth in everything we do, right? Yeah. Somebody help me. I thank you for this honor, really, of being invited here to Hanford. I thought I was coming to Portland, and then I realized that the, Portland, the Occupy Portlanders had organized this all the way where Hanford really is. I didn't know it because I come from the east, more recently from Nevada Test Site, Nevada Desert Experience. So I'm really coming to bring lots and lots of honor and and um, wishes greetings from several places that's my purpose in coming from the nevada desert experience from the nevada test site which for <coughs> nearly 60 years now <coughs> has been uh, detonating 1000 atom bombs on the sacred lands of the Western Shoshone people. I'm sure many of you know the story of that and you have followed it closely and many have been there. How many have actually been to the test site here? Yep. Yes, arrested, gotcha, gotcha, right. We've had thousands there. And uh, I guess it's my only ticket to being uh, eligible to be here because I did have had the last only seven years living there. I was living and working in West Africa before that, but I knew about Hanford, and we followed closely the tragic stories of the, your dramatically gorgeous Columbia River with its living resources so damaged and polluted and diseased as the land and the life uh, in that Nevada desert test site, which is the size of the state of Rhode Island. I also came today because I happen to be privileged to be in New York City on the 12th of March, or the 11th of March, excuse me, the actual day when we commemorated the Fukushima explosion, or disaster, and I have, uh, I listened to young, probably in their early 20s, 14 Japanese men and women who had come over to be there in New York City in the USA, which probably was the source of many of their nuclear reactors. And those young women, I think, said something that you will all appreciate hearing. And I'm just going to read their words because I was so moved by what they were saying in perfect English there in Union Square Park on the 11th of March this year. And I think we can honor them and all the people in Fukushima for the amount of work that they've been able to do in this one year. Hasn't it been eliminating or closing down more than 50 nuclear power stations with only one left to go in one year? I think that's the, those are the facts. We have a lot to learn from the energy and the experience of the Japanese. 
This is what they said. Uh, they said four pages of this. There were about four of them taking, or six of them, giving these messages. And I'm just going to give you two of them, very brief. Uh, let, this is what one said. Let me tell you what happened in Japan. At there, power companies get up to 13 billion in subsidies from the government to build a nuclear power plant. Once the location is chosen, the power company showers the locals with money. They take the guys to hostess bars and the old people to hot springs. Uh, <clears throat> wine and dine, wine and dine. And they lie to them about the nuclear plant being good for the local economy. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. They actually have a manual on how to use the money to divide the community into supporters and opponents. Fishermen even sell off their fishing rights for enormous sums. And there's a PR barrage, sound familiar? That nothing but propaganda about safety measures and secret dangerous experiments. Where does the money for all that come from? You know, from everyone's taxes. This is how Japan has aggressively constructed 59 nuclear power plants, either operating, decommissioned, or planned. And finally, they said, this means that our families and friends are now living with over 50 time bombs strapped to their bodies. Even if one blows up, the entire area around it becomes uninhabitable for all living things. And Japan built these reactors under the banner of peacefully using nuclear power. But the real reason is that the government wants nuclear weapons. Does that sound familiar? And so I'm coming to ask for a future action from Portland, Occupy Portland, and from all the Occupies around this country. An idea has sprung up in these past two or three months that it's based on the fact that we never hear mentioned the United States arsenal of nuclear weapons when we try to launch a war into Iraq, Iran, because they may have one in the future. And so we thought if we could, uh, if the Occupy people from all over this country, as well as in Europe, because there are many, and even in Moscow, we have a connection there, would give a day just to bring out the information about the United States nuclear weapons arsenal, which is never even mentioned, is it? <laughs> so if we could do that, and not only do that on this certain day, simultaneously around the country, also expose this horrendous plan to modernize and to expand and to proliferate nuclear weapons to the cost of what could be well over, in the, if it ever gets uh, implemented, well over a trillion dollars. They talk about, you know, 650 billion, but it will all, it could, it would be far more than that. To expand Los Alamos, to expand Kansas City nuclear facility, and to expand Oak Ridge nuclear facility, the production, for the production of plutonium. So in other words, to make more nuclear weapons, not start disarming as we've been pledging, as the United States has pledged itself to do, of the administration that is, I guess. Uh, anyway, they pledged to do it in May of, 19, of 2000, um, 
2010, didn't they? When the Russian latest start to agreements were being uh, held. And now here we are with this huge um, um, appropriation for expanding the nuclear weapons facilities. So if we could do that, we're hoping to spread the word around through your great network of communication and have a day, perhaps the 6th of August, the 7th of August, the 8th of August, or the 9th of August, sometime around Hiroshima Nagasaki commemoration days. And all come out together around this country, in Europe, and in Moscow with the same message. What do you think about it? Yeah. Okay, I bring that to you in, in, with, uh, in honor of, in Washington State, your two prison, no, only one prisoner left in Washington State for entering the uh, Bangor Naval Trident submarine base to expose the fact that in this state you have roughly one, 2,000 nuclear weapons stored. Isn't that true? Yeah. Above, before, uh, bigger or less. Anyway, in the range of 2,000, being not only storing them, but constantly being modified, modernized, and made ready for use, which is, anyway, we don't have to say that to you. So Steve Kelly is still in uh, prison in SeaTac federal prison in solitary confinement for that wonderful action that the five of them performed on the on the uh, not, for, second of November 2009 when they octogenarians and 60 year olds got right into the place in view of the uh, bunkers. So we honor and Steve honors you and blesses you from his solitary confinement in resistance to the illegality of that trial. The illegality of the United States government for having continued in the nuclear business. And also Stu Susan Crane, who's down there in Dublin, California. They too said, both send their love to you and honor you for your presence here today. And we all know that nuclear energy is linked inextricably with nuclear weapons. I believe in nonviolence. I believe in resistance. There's nothing wrong with getting arrested. Yeah. I've done it almost a hundred times. Wow. It's all American and it's whole. Uh -oh. At home we call it a life of high adventure. I oppose nuclear weapons so I do something about it. I despise nuclear power, so I let the companies know. The first day I walked into work at the Progressive Magazine in Madison, Wisconsin, I knew I was in trouble. Back in 1983, I became a peace activist and nonviolent resistor while working there. Everybody should work at the Progressive. <laughs> Civil resistance is my passion in this collective struggle we're in to save ourselves. No harm in nonviolent resistance to draw attention to the deadly nuclear industry and to senseless ongoing war. In January, I finished eight months for climbing through a fence at the Y-12 weapons factory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Next time, I expect you all to be with me. I know you can and do write letters, sign petitions, pass out literature, call into radio programs, write songs, do dances, create art and videos. I know you plaster your cars with bumper stickers. You may belong to an organization that purchased a, pill, a billboard for peace, painted a mural, and had a discussion about community justice. Perhaps you've joined a march or a vigil and now occupy. Maybe you organized a run for freedom. Maybe you even recycled your TV. <laughs> there are so many things to do, like buy responsibly, picket, strike, divest from harmful industries. Why, you could refuse to pay your taxes, help blockade the entrance of a weapons manufacturer, sit in a tree to prevent clear cutting and save old growth trees, occupy, occupy a nuclear missile silo, even do a citizen's arrest of nuclear war planners 
and manufacturers. My dream is that one day we will walk up to the White House and simply ask for the keys. Yeah! yeah. But in the meantime, I love you. <laughs> our water is being poisoned, food supply altered, people tortured, and everyone today and in the future radioactively contaminated. And then there's drive, drive, drive. You know the story. Each of us is responsible. For three decades, 25, 29 years to be exact, I have resisted the nuclear industry and the war system, and I know that what I do is not enough. And I know we are not enough yet. And I know this is no time to stop. As people have turned their focus to climate change, the reality of nuclear war and the danger of nuclear reactors have been minimized in the media and industry, even in the face of Fukushima. Don't believe the nuclear utilities that nuclear power is green, cheap, or more importantly, safe. Don't. When it comes to nuclear weapons, the law is on our side. The Nuremberg Principles, the Geneva Conventions, the Hague Conventions, the International Court of Justice at the Hague, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the UN General Assembly, the UN uh, yeah, Assembly Resol Resolutions, Humanitarian Law, Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution, Making Treaties the Supreme Law of the Land, the Fifth Commandment, God, the Golden Rule, <laughs> Sam Day, my mentor, and I all agree that the mere possession of nuclear weapons is immoral, in illegal, and a crime against humanity. Yeah. 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 Our situation is serious, and nuclear weapons make it grave. The flight to impact time for your average nuclear weapon is 12 minutes. That's it. And what if it's a computer accident? Shit happens. The fact that nuclear weapons sit on hair trigger alert deserves nonviolent civil resistance and more. And the more people we are, the more change happens. Yeah. The nuclear freeze movement of the 80s would not have been complete without nonviolent civil disobedience. From Greenham Common and the Seneca yeah. Women's Peace Camp, yeah. we're part of an influential bunch of people, folks working to stop nuclear testing in Nevada, were arrested by the thousands. Millions marched in Washington. Plowshares activists showed us what real disarmament looks like. Got a weapon? Take it apart. All it takes is a hammer. Yeah. Think Woo. now of the women uh, working to close Vermont Yankee, the reactor out there. Yeah. Frances Crow of Northampton, Massachusetts said yeah. she wants Vermont, Vermont Yankee to cease operations because she feels it's a threat to the people who live by live nearby. She's 93 years old and asked when hum and asked how many times she'd been arrested. She answered, "Not enough." Yeah. Yeah. Think of the assets to getting arrested. It's great studio time, even if toilet paper is the only artist's resource. Oh wait, sometimes there's no toilet paper. <laughs> have a new experience. Meet people you would never otherwise have the opportunity to meet. Have the chance to go to court. Come face to face with our soldiers, their guns and tanks. Meet the police, get a ride, go to court, be silenced and found guilty, get another ride, go to jail, have your picture taken, wear the ugliest clothes imaginable, and used the clean underwear, watch TV all day, play cards, live in solidarity with the poor, marginalized, and oppressed people of our society, meet new people, and celebrate the day like never before when you get out. All right, and you can also get, let me show you, my show and tell right here. I got this free going to jail. Antiperspirant deodorant made by the Bob Barker Company Incorporated and it is called Maximum Security. You can get one of these. Actually, people in the jails these days are hungry and rehabilitation is an illusion fed to the people on the outside. Furthermore, the jails and prisons deserve us. 
It's the activists of the United States who typically speak on behalf of the millions and millions of people in our jails and prisons. I've been asked if civil resistance or disobedience works. I don't know. I know it can't hurt. And I'm a firm believer in trying everything. So sign those petitions, sing those songs, join your hands together, then nonviolently step across the line to resist. It's a song called Peace and Love. Discovery Channel thing, so I'm not gonna talk about how for, but I can talk about like five topics really quick. One is the ongoing revolution, the revolutionary effort that is happening in Japan, and the next thing is the uh, maybe you care about the accountability and education, so I'm gonna talk about that. And three is the backlash by the government and um, military and industry that is about this propaganda set up in Japan right now and globally and nationally. And fourth, I want to talk about California. What is going on in California? And probably I can propose something. And uh, yeah, like maybe as other speakers have already said, like we can find uh, intersections of the problem. So the first thing is the revolution. What I call revolutions in Japan is not like one single the revolution, but people who are surviving and people who are most conscious about this catastrophe of ongoing Fukushima accidents are mothers, fathers, parents. And how they started doing this is that they started monitoring the breastfed milk. So if you're a mother, you can imagine it is a courageous act. You don't want to know about what's going on. You don't want to know what's going to happen to your kids. And you don't want to know the tremendous amount of effort that you have to establish between the people around you. It's going to surely create battles, but people are doing that. People got Geiger counters or people cross borders and then try to do the monitoring of breastfed milk. And then mothers, fathers sneaked into the backyard and schoolyard and started Geiger countering, monitoring, getting the sand into the, you know, to the boards of Ed and said, lick the soil. Lick the soil. And if you can lick the soil, you can talk about it. So that's one of the things that I call revolution. Of course, in Tokyo area, you have seen, you may have seen so many things, like 20,000 people marching, yes, but that's, that's a number, and I don't know, I can't represent those people, so maybe you can, you know, bridge and talk to the people. It's not the number. Dr. Helen Caldicott made a um, really impressive speech, and I really love her, and I really thank her for educating us, but 
I would argue this is not, you're not like a little poor crowd. Each one of you is an activist. Each one of you is an organizer. You have a whole community. So I wouldn't call you poor little crowd. And we are disturbing people who may not be here. And there are people who are watching us. So it's nice. And uh, in Japan, almost all the reactors are shut down. It's good. But three days ago, they said, oh, well, we have scarcity of electricity, so we have to restart it. How people did, you know, did the resistance is like 1,600 people surrounded the house of the prime minister. That's great. That's great. But 1,600 people. What, what was going on in 2011, April? It was like 20,000 people marching. So the number itself is decreasing, right? So we have to think about how to analyze and how to connect with the resistance of other people. There are definitely splits in the community. Maybe in this community of people who are fighting with, uh, you know, Hanford, there are splits already, but, you know, we can talk about that. You know, we can keep building up. And, yeah, accountability in an education, there are... You know, it's, it's called the Northwest, Northwest and Cascadia. It's great that you termed yourself that way. And there's estimated, as of July, there are 60,000 people from Northeast Japan have migrated and scattered around all over that is less contaminated. 60,000 people in four months. That's about like the double size of UC Berkeley students. Isn't that impressive? I call it that's a migration diaspora. And when we think about the former resistance, like Underground Railroad, that's a tremendous amount of number that people who are aware, we're not even reported, but people who are doing that. Right now, as the reactor number four in Fukushima is breaking down, I have to ask my mother, are you gonna be keep being a slave or are you gonna emancipate yourself? Get yourself ready. And she said she's ready. So she's going down south. So that's good. Yeah. So yeah, and you know, we can learn that kind of diaspora topic from the people who fought with, the, you know, who fought with like so many different struggles. Prison industrial complex, as it was mentioned, or the diaspora community who fought against the dictatorship in the Philippines, or we can talk about all the resisting communities. And I want to also talk about and get you ready for how bottomlessly a state, nation state government can go wrong. Um, some thrilling stories. Japan says, eat and support Fukushima veggies. Eat the veggies contaminated. And holding marathons, children run through Fukushima without masks and anything. And there are pageants. University students, beautiful people, they are eating Fukushima veggies. And the municipal governments all over Japan are saying, oh, we gotta help these disasters struck an area. So, yeah, we gotta get the pebbles, radiated pebbles, and then burn it so we can help support a disaster struck an area. What's behind are corporations like Bechtel. They are our families and friends with municipal government. So they need the money. There's a tremendous m money out of this decontamination business, as you're already familiar with the Hanford site. And they are also fake labeling vegetables and selling to Philippines, or we're specifically looking for nation states or countries in hunger, and then selling these contaminated veggies in North Africa, for example. And we're trying to export these pebbles to Mongolia, and I heard about Colorado and Utah are also proposed. We shouldn't do that. And also, we're getting working visas for the people, immigrants from like Vietnam and Thailand. And they are supported by both governments to learn peaceful nuclear energy. Do we believe in that? No, we don't believe in that. So this is the imperialism. So this is not even about the March 11th, or this is not even about the nuclear. This is about victimizing people, silencing people, and this is a part of the huge imperialism and the huge invasion. So what is happening in nuclear, like uh, California is that since August, we formed different groups and the people realize the impact of Fukushima and the impact of other accidents like in here, or like in, uh, you know, Three Mile, like in all the other places. We have so much different issues, nuclear weapons, mining, 
you know, missiles launching and, you know, so many others. But, and UC Berkeley, for example, academia has its own problem. Bechtel is still trying to build up the narratives for our security and our recovery from disasters all over in Louisiana and in Japan. That's a bullshit, as you know. So we say, okay, let's get together, whatever you do. So we call, we form this thing called Nuke Free California. And two delegates from Miyagi, that's next to Fukushima, visited. Ordinary mothers and fathers who are reluctant to call themselves activists, but they have done secret, you know, activism, like, you know, stealing sand, going to the Board of Ed, mobilizing people with texting and Twittering. So they came over and they said two things. One is that your industry, your nation state will tell you lies, right? And the second thing is that you have to protect yourself by monitoring. You have to monitor Geiger counter. You can never trust, like, well, you can trust watchdog people. They, they have, like, knowledges and skills, but we have to be able to use that. So, people from, you know, San Onofre area, 50 miles radius of San Onofre started um, this, like, monitoring system. So, people in the, right now, at the point of March 11th, when people saw this, people had no idea. How many of you have this Geiger counter? Yes, how many? Show your hands. Okay, I don't see, or maybe I'm blind, but yeah, like you can, you can connect with the people. So people started, you know, being accountable for themselves. People started accumulating data, compare, because these things are not even perfect. So people started measuring food, water, soil, or whole body counters, depending on what you want to check. For the Hanford, since it has a, like, a long history, maybe you want different kind of Geiger counters. But it's great that people started monitoring. And what it did was it really rose people's awareness in Orange County. You know, so NRC Yatsko came down and started talking about, is it really safe to restart San Onofre? And people also build up like commercials. They broadcasted commercials. People who were on couches saw it called, you know, South California Edison. That's one of the things that we can do. You know, maybe this is not a, even a good place to occupy. You know, I worry about you, seriously. So when you go home, please wash your hands and probably goggle, you know, like wash, wash your mouth. You didn't say anything dirty, but you gotta wash your mouth and wash your throat. Yeah, so. I think, you know, this is enough about, you know, what is going on. And also their writers, I want to say one more thing. In California, there are writers who have enough knowledge and who have been starting, you know, writing about their resistance after fall of the Fukushima, namely Libby Halivi, who survived uh, Three Mile Island. Or Kim, she has a podcast called, called the Nuclear Hot Seat. You should Google it. You can listen to it on iTunes. It's weekly iPod, and you can educate yourself, and it's really good. And you can drive, and you can educate yourself, and you can be active. And Kimberly Robertson and Cecil Pineda, these people are starting to learn the intersections of this catastrophe, Fukushima, here, Hanford, and what is going on in Idaho and other places. So I really encourage you to, you know, speak up and accumulate your own knowledge. That's, the, that's going to be the best data, and that's going to be the best resources, that it's more accountable than the ones in Bechtel, the ones in UC Berkeley. we got to attack these people. we got to attack these academia. And the revolution that is happening in Japan is that the shift in the dynamics of the people. There's no more professional. There's no more scholars. But we are accountable for ourselves. So we're no more little poor crowds, but we're going to normalize our voice. We are a loud mouth, and we got to, you know, keep going. we got to wrestle around. And I would like to end the speech with, the, you know, thank you again for organizing. There's, like, a circle of the people who have been doing, like, food, music, and the cars, people who, you know, made me nap. You know, <laughs> like, really, really great things. And I, I have tons of things to learn from you. So I really appreciate it. And um, I think Miriam has been picking up a lot of, like, you know, garbages. And I think it's going to be important to keep the venue for protesting so no more police will harassing us. And please let the kids be educated. And, you know, I learned about the Chernobyl when I was six. And I survived a small minor reactor accident in the Musashino Kogyo University in 1989. And children can learn. 
you know, children can learn and educate themselves. So please, please inform your, you know, inform through your behaviors and, you know, do whatever you can. And don't let your children ask you something like, I talk to my mother. Don't, don't be slaves to people. Emancipate yourself and decolonize. You know, occupy yourself, please. I moved to Hermiston, Oregon in 1977. I grew up spending summers at the river, swimming, barbecuing, water skiing. Our drinking water came from local wells, our food from local farms and ranches. The friends I had were from here, and our children were born here. Many of my friends worked for the railroad, others were tradesmen working construction, some at Hanford. We worked hard, we paid our taxes, and we helped others in need whenever we could. We thought life was good. There were 14 of us who were quite close friends and we spent most of our time together, years in fact, and we considered ourselves family. Today, as I stand here talking to you, I am one of only four left. Brain tumors, liver tumors, pancreatic tumors, breast and uterine tumors, all of which were cancerous, claimed the lives of my brothers and sisters. Then five years ago, I was diagnosed with stage, stage four breast cancer, which has since spread to my bones and it's terminal. I'm not alone though. There are many others I'm aware of, neighbors and their family members, friends of friends, and countless lives lost and lives affected. I'm certain that those of you listening to me here have also lost loved ones to some form of cancer. And the problem here is you're not going to get the real statistics about how prevalent it is in, in this area. You're not going to know how long the cases have been increasing in number either. The truth isn't going to be easy to find. But here's the thing. I don't need facts and figures, nor do I expect an admission of guilt. I didn't come here for sympathy. I'm not here to speak as an expert about the effects of radiation. I'm not a scientist, nor am I an environmentalist capable of quoting the EPA acceptable standards for toxins in the air, the water, or the soil. And I don't have a PhD in nuclear physics. I can tell you what I felt like during my years, four of them, years of chemotherapy and, and radiation. I can tell you that it's as close as I ever want to get to what it would be like if we had a major spill here. But in spite of what credentials I don't have and personal experience that I do, that's not why I'm here now. The reason I've come here to share the details of my personal life with you is because I believe that human beings are capable of intelligent solutions. I believe that we are reasonable and thoughtful and naturally compassionate beings. And finally, I'm here because I refuse to give up believing in the existence of human life. <sighs> my heart is very heavy and it's full of fear. Even more so now that I've been deemed terminal, but it's not my own life that frightens me or my own death. I hear people say that they would do anything to protect their children and we as parents are responsible for keeping them safe from harm. For the majority of human beings, it's a natural instinct to put their own well-being at risk to save a child from danger. And while we speak the words, we fail to make them true. My mind struggles to comprehend the ways many of my fellow human beings fail to grasp the nature of what's really at stake. We are so caught up in day-to-day -day survival, paying our bills, putting food on the table, saving for our kids to go to college, that we don't see what's right in front of us. We read the headlines, watch the news, discuss and debate the pros and cons of nuclear energy, the economic crisis, the ineffectiveness of the government, and how it's become a whore to the 1%. Then we go to bed, get up the next day, and the cycle repeats. This cycle is exactly what they're counting on. The 1% are betting their very existence that the remaining 99% of us will do nothing more than spout out a few half-hearted but angry accusations, and that will be the extent of it. Disgruntled cries here and there, then back to business as usual. That they might be right is what I fear the most. We claim we want our children to have every opportunity for a long and happy life, but do we understand the sacrifices that must be made to ensure it? 
while we would fight with unbridled savagery and lay down our own lives to protect our child from an attacker, we are simultaneously guilty of standing by while the 1% lay claim to the air, the soil, and the water our children require for their very survival. How can we justify this hypocrisy? We complain about the way things are and yet do little more than spend a couple of hours at a rally holding a sign and chanting the familiar mantras before going back to our lives and going through the motions. Gone is the commitment and the desire to bring that change we all agree on. It's gone from our focus the moment we click on the TV. Smoke and mirrors, the dog and pony show. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You know how it goes. Stop avoiding the truth because you're being distracted with the part of the 1%'s marketing budget. That's how you feed the beast designed to brainwash you into a conformist consumer that continues to line their pockets. But it doesn't have to be that way when you leave here today. We all want our lives to have meant something. We want our children to be proud of who we were and what we left for them. This will be the most precious gift we can give them. This world is their inheritance. I believe we can do better than we have. They deserve a fair chance with a planet that isn't stripped of its resources and full of toxic waste. When we come together in solidarity with our focus being about what we do to protect and preserve this planet, we have the ability to save our children. But first, we must make ourselves understand that it goes beyond today. It requires more effort on our part. We have made a difference through the Occupy movement. We must continue to work towards restoring the power to the people and bringing this country back to the place where our representatives actually represented us. Hold them accountable. Stop believing that it's a damn shame and you can't fight the government. Stand up to the very real threats that are going to harm our future generations. Congressional reform is a must. Depersonalizing corporations is imperative. Abolishing the Fed is critical. We know what we must do. We know we have the right. We have the responsibility. And we have the ability because we are the 99%. online and this is how I'm going to end up here. Um, I don't know who wrote it. It was just signed anonymous, but um, I I thought that was rather fitting. So (laughs) I decided I would give them credit for it. But um, it said, at the end of life, what really matters is not what we bought, but what we built. Not what we had, but what we shared. Not only our competence, but also our character and not only our successes, but also our significance. Live a life that matters. Live a life of love.